this way you can you can step over here and say something off the record to us. Off the record. <laughs> yeah, sure, I actually perfect purposely angled it so that I uh, didn't stand behind the podium. But yeah, it's okay. I know it's annoying. Yeah, I'll I'll make it work by going like this. Sounds like I'm about to, I'm supposed to eat it or something. I don't know. No, I think it'll be fine. Yeah. Okay. Just use your normal voice. Yeah, which is loud enough. <laughs> Um, did you get my note about uh, David changing his meeting time? So I'll be a little later to your, to your office. Oh. It'll be 4 or 5, but uh, it's probably going to end at 4 or 5 in my guess. Yeah, um, please just come to the front here. Yeah, sounds good. If I do seem to be running really late, do feel free to correct me if uh, I'm in a heated well, conversation. It's all good things, I think. Cool. Yeah, I think things are good. David comes to the front because uh, I am ready for the, his question. Why didn't you just do this automated? Well, assuming you have comfort, why would you need anything else? Comfort in the data that you have that the data you would get from comfort. Yeah. yeah. Like oh, if you comfort. comfort, comfort. So like if you get what people want to see, why don't you just optimize for that? That's a reasonable. David thinks it is, though. <laughs> That's where we differ on our, on our goals and values. coming. CSAIL before becoming a uh, professor of computer science at uh, Northwestern University, where one of the things that he does is uh, supervise design, technology, and research program in which he has an army of undergraduates um, working on research and publishing actual papers. And I hope that's one of the things you'll be talking about today when you tell us about computational ecosystems. So welcome, Hao Chi. Looking forward to what you have to say. Thank you, Rob. All right. Uh, Thanks for the wonderful introduction, and uh, thank you guys for coming. Uh, so, so in this talk, I, I want to share with you um, how I've worked to align my work uh, with my values and my hopes for the world. Um, so the, the, the hope for the talk isn't so much that you walk out of here with my values, um, but instead it inspires you to think a little bit about um, how to realize yours, and I think that'd be really wonderful. Okay, so with that, I'd like to share some thoughts on computational ecosystems. Um, and what I think they could do for advancing human values at scale. 
Um, so as I've come to learn more about my work, um, I've come to realize that there's this general challenge underlying all the problems that I'm interested in. And the challenge is this. Um, how can we create scalable solutions to human problems and advance desired human values in the absence of a technology that can overcome real world constraints? Okay? So as a computer scientist, as someone who designs technologies, this is a really unfortunate question for me to be asking, right? And probably an unfortunate thing that I'm speaking here today as well. Um, but this is just the question that, that kept coming up. Okay, so let me give you an example. Um, so not long after I started at Northwestern, um, I began mentoring undergraduate students in research, um, independent research, through this new program I created called Design, Technology, and Research. And um, this photo is from spring 2014, um, when I started with just seven students. Okay, and pretty quickly, uh, in less than two years, I was mentoring over 20 students uh, on 14 independent research projects. And very quickly, what I learned is that this thing called faculty time, it, it doesn't scale, <laughs> it doesn't stretch, okay? Um, so, the, you know, there were times where I was up till very late for many days in a row just trying to keep things rolling, okay? And, and um, you know, you might say that, oh, how to you're being a dedicated mentor, but uh, really I was just suffering, right? And it wasn't gonna ever scale that way. Um, so the question then, or the challenge is this. So how can a single faculty mentor train 20 plus students, right? So scaling solutions to this problem, um, to cultivate autonomous, self-directed learners who are capable of doing independent research and then building new knowledge. These were the human values that I cared about advancing. Um, and then in the absence of a technology that scales my time, right? The part that doesn't stretch very well and this being the, the real world constraint. Um, and it turns out that this question is really hard because the best human solution we know, um, which is excellent, um, unfortunately doesn't scale very well, okay? And the solution is called apprenticeship. Um, or one-on-one -on -one mentoring, and it's a highly effective model of training people to do complex tasks. Uh, in particular, uh, in this case, for research, complex cognitive tasks. Okay. Um, but Alan Collins, who's kind of like the godfather of cognitive apprenticeship, or apprenticeship of complex skills, he, he sadly reminds us that uh, it requires a very small teacher-to-learner ratio that's not realistic in the large educational systems of modern economy. And unlike for some other problems, um, there's not really a clear best machine solution in sight. Okay? So software can be used to provide helpful prompts to guide student thinking, um, but no AI technology is gonna replace the faculty mentor anytime soon. And the way to think about that is that we lack these computational models for solving complex ill-structured problems that are common in design and in research, um, and models of instruction for teaching students how to do that. Okay? And then without that, we're not gonna have a machine solution. Um, and this seems to leave us with very few options, right? So we could wait for a technological silver bullet, but it could take quite some time or maybe it'll never come. Um, we could compromise in a variety of ways. We could scale the lecture classroom, for example, with MOOCs. We could train a small set of elite students, which is what we typically do as faculty. Um, or we could give undergraduate students root work, right? So just give them something to do. They're not really self-directing their research project. They're not learning to do independent research, but you know, they're doing something and that's better than nothing. Um, and I think those are all reasonable compromises, but none of the options really provide the same learning benefit, right? And those were the values that I really cared about. Um, so the question we've been asking is, is there an or? Is there another option um, for approaching these kinds of problems? Um, and over the last five years, this general question has led us to the design of what I call computational ecosystems. And what computational ecosystems are is that they interweave community processes social structures, and intelligent systems to unite people and machines to overcome these larger challenges. Okay. So as you can see from this figure, uh, computational ecosystems incorporate many different components, um, but the goal here is not just to concern ourselves with the design of components, but instead with the design of the whole system. And this focus on a systems approach to design echoes calls from people like Atul Gawande here at the Harvard Medical School, um, who argues that in essence, Having great components is not enough, okay? So Atul says, uh, we've been obsessed in medicine with components, want the best drug, the best technology, the best specialist, we don't think too much about how it all comes together. It's a terrible design strategy, actually. And Atul goes on to say um, that making systems work is the great task of our generation of physicians and scientists. I will go further to say that making systems work, whether it's in healthcare, education, climate change, and making a pathway out of poverty, is the great task of our generation as a whole. 
Uh, we also see calls for system level thinking uh, in artificial intelligence. So here I have a quote from Eric Horvitz, who is the director of Microsoft Research. And Eric says that I'm pretty sure that the next leaps in AI will come from integrative systems rather than wedges. So wedges being uh, components or wedges of intelligence. We need to focus on building a system where the whole is greater than the parts. Um, in HCI, there's been similar calls for a need for system level thinking. Um, one of these calls comes from George Furness, um, who in this wonderful paper that I recommend a lot of you read if you haven't seen it before, called Future Design Mindful of the Morass, um, he argues that it's likely that our designs will be more successful if we come be become more mindful of the bigger picture, the mosaic of responsive adaptive systems. Um, and the idea here is that we're building applications that really fit into these bigger systems, and until we really understand how they fit in, uh, we're not gonna be that successful. And I think it's really wise for us to heed what George is saying here, um, but as, as it turns out, we're gonna need to do more than just to be mindful of the larger system when designing applications. Um, what I'm gonna argue for in this talk is that we actually need to design the entire system. Um, so to design the entire system, I take a socio-technical approach, as you may already be familiar with, but I extend it um, to account for some of the added complexity of designing the entire system as, as a single thing. Um, so for instance, when we design socio-technical systems, we do typically consider the context of this larger system, um, but in practice, the solutions are often designed component by component or layer by layer. Okay? So let me give you some examples of that. So for example, we might think about supporting group collaboration and we'll focus on designing new collaboration technologies for a group. Um, or more recently, right, we might design technologies uh, for coordinating crowds. Um, but the question I'm asking with the computational ecosystems approach is can we try to understand how we might bring in multiple structures of people and interactions that could come together to jointly solve a problem where we might use crowds and groups. Um, and this is gonna allow us to explore some potential synergies that could arise um, when we look beyond the component interactions and look at how they could inform each other um, to enable new kinds of solutions. So let me give you another example. Um, we might typically think about uh, designing layer by layer, okay? So we might come up with a process of working or a way a community works, and then we'll design the social structures um, that support that process. And then we might go about designing tools uh, to support these processes and social structures that we come up. Um, this is a really thoughtful approach to designing technologies Right? Especially when you can't change um, the processes and the social structures that are in place. Uh, but the question I'm asking here is if you could, there might be entire uh, opportunities to, to design entire vertical slices, right? Where we could look at new compositions of processes, structures, and technologies that best work well together. And what I'm gonna argue is that by designing this way, we might get very different designs than if you assume certain things to be fixed. Um, so what I'm saying here is that with computational ecosystems, we're gonna be interested in designing simultaneously all the components of a socio-technical system as a single integrative solution. Uh, we're still gonna be thinking about people and technology, but we're gonna take a more comprehensive approach where we're gonna construct um, both the parts and how those parts interact, both technically and, and people-wise as well. Um, so to reason about this added complexity, um, we're gonna adopt two helpful perspectives uh, when we go about designing these computational ecosystems. Um, the first one is what I call computational thinking, right, as you would know it, um, but where we're thinking about decomposing and distributing problem solving to diverse peoples and machines across this entire ecosystem. Okay, so we might have many different uh, machine components and human components uh, in this larger system. Um, the other thing that I have up here is called ecological thinking, and the idea is to think about how to create sustainable processes and interactions that support both the ecosystem's needs um, but also uh, uh, that of its members, right? So really balancing and trying to bring into harmony um, the needs of the, the members and as well as, as for the ecosystem to actually function the way it should. Um, so for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna present to you two examples of computational ecosystems that we've designed um, for advancing community-based planning and for scaling research training. Um, I'm then gonna preview what's next in computational ecosystems and finally just end with a couple of thoughts on the role of computing technologies for advancing human values uh, at scale. So before I move on to present my first example, any questions uh, for clarification thus far? Yeah, please. I'd love for you to back up the slide and just dig a little deeper into what you mean by ecological thinking. So yep. with computational thinking, I would think a failure would be you have an algorithm that runs an exponential time or something. Mm -hmm. What's a failure of, of ecological thinking? Aha, uh -huh. so I'll give you some examples. 
Yeah, sure. So I mean, I think it's one of those things where, um, right? So the thing that could fail is one of these two parts, right? So you could either uh, get the members to not want to do what they want to do, right? You're not really supporting the membership, and then you know you lead to a failure in ecosystem function, right? Or maybe you try to support ecosystem function and you say you have to do this, and then the ecosystem will run, but then the members don't really want to do that, and then you lose your members, and then the ecosystem falls apart as well. Right? So it's really thinking about how to design these interactions that you know we sometimes don't think about in crowdsourcing, certainly uh, on platforms like Mechanical Turk, where you know we just pay people money and then they do the stuff, right? But for a lot of these communities that I'm going to design, um, you know, there's no money involved, and and a lot of the motivation and getting things to run um, has to do with making sure that both of these things are happening, that the community is achieving its purpose, but the members are also getting um, what they want out of those interactions. Okay, and I'll give you some examples of that. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah, I'll take one more. Excellent. So uh, let me go on and um, present to you guys my first example, um, where I'd like to talk to you about community-based planning, where we think about designing as our values an inclusive process for planning community-based events that scales and that advances the goals of its members. Um, so some of you have seen parts of this work before on Kobe, uh, but I hope that seeing this as a computational ecosystem is going to help provide some new insights. So the specific use case uh, we're going to look at today is uh, planning large academic conferences. Okay? So what I'm showing you here uh, is a handful of ACs or associate chairs working to come up with a preliminary schedule for CHI. Okay? It's a large ACI conference. Um, where they're trying to construct hundreds of sessions from about 500 papers um, over a two-day period on hand, by hand. Okay? So this is what they're doing. And pretty quickly, um, you could imagine that the organizers face some challenges. So one of the challenges they face is that you have about uh, 10 people in the room here, um, and they're, they're really trying to do the best they can right, to figure out how to group these papers and to create these initial sessions, but they don't really know what it is that people want. right? I mean, they have a very small slice of this big conference that's kind of expanded to a point where the knowledge about what even goes together um, in terms of papers fitting together in a session is really distributed across this larger community. Um, furthermore, um, the organizers lack tools for managing the complexity of planning okay, and for resolving conflict. So what they do in the room is on paper, and then when they go home, um, the organizers put this into a computer, and then they go through this painful process of resolving conflict, where they could move a session or a paper to somewhere else to, to get rid of a conflict, but then when they make a swap, uh, it creates a conflict somewhere else. Okay? And what the organizers describe this as is a terrible game of whack-a-mole, right? where the moles are conflicts, where you get rid of one, and then you create another one. Right? And I think some of you might already be wondering, well, why don't we just run an optimizer to do this, and I'll, I'll get to that uh, a, a little bit later too, but one of the points I want to make is that you know, the organizers are really trying to do a good job to account for the things uh, that they know might be good or bad uh, in terms of creating a session. So they'd rather go through, right? So take this as, as the point of they'd rather go through this painful manual process uh, than use software, and there's something there uh, in that idea. So, so we'll go back to that as we, as we keep talking. So to, to overcome these challenges, uh, we created Kobe. It's a computational ecosystem for a process that we call community-informed planning. Okay? And Kobe is built on just two simple ideas. Uh, the first is engage the entire community in the planning process. And the second one is giving organizers tools to manage the complexity of planning and to be able to resolve conflicts. Okay? Um, so these ideas are really simple, uh, but the question really is how, right? Like, how do you do this? Um, and here, I think there's some interesting ecosystems-y kind of ideas here that, that we'll explore. Um, so first, to engage the entire uh, community in planning, uh, we created new processes and tools for involving committee members, authors, and attendees. Okay. So we have committee members uh, make initial sessions after the PC meeting through a process we call committee sourcing. And then we ask authors to tell us which papers they think fit in a session with their own, um, but also what talks they want to see to make sure that the talks that the authors want to see don't get scheduled at the same time as their own talk in a different session. 
Uh, we also help attendees navigate the schedule with a nice tool called Comfort. Um, and uh, it's going to recommend to people papers and sessions. And then it uses the favorites that people identify um, to know which are the popular sessions, right? So we could know that which talks need to be scheduled in bigger rooms, for example. Um, or what are talks of mutual interest that a lot of people are interested in seeing this and this, but we don't want to schedule them at the same time then, right? We want to make sure they're at different points in the schedule. Uh, so, so far, this is all very reasonable, right? And this is very much a user center design, crowdsourcing kind of question um, that you might be familiar with. Um, but right off the bat, there's actually some computational challenges that, that pop up, okay? So um, if we're talking about session making, uh, we have to account for how to coordinate this kind of problem solving when there's what we call global constraints. Okay, so let me just give you an example of this, right? So for any paper, a paper could fit into many different sessions, right? Like there's many different ways of theming the sessions where this paper would make sense in those sessions. Um, so you might think that, well, if we just put every paper into some theme, then we're done. Um, but actually, right, it, that, that doesn't really work because uh, once a paper is committed to one of those sessions, all the other papers that we're going to be in some other session with that paper, it, it just kind of breaks apart. Right, so there's this interdependence across the sessions um, that we need to account for, and if we want to get people to collaborate on this, then we have to have a mechanism for them to be able to collaborate effectively um, while dealing with these interdependencies. Um, so to resolve this challenge, uh, the core, uh, the first ecosystems kind of idea I want to present to you uh, is this two-phase collaborative planning process that involves both a large crowd of all the ACs and a smaller group of about just 10 ACs. So there's two phases. Um, in phase one, we're having all the ACs involved and we're eliciting from them metadata or possible groupings of sessions. And then in phase two, the smaller group of ACs, given all these different flexible options, um, they could deliberate and they could discuss to better satisfy the tighter constraints. That would be really hard to work on in a crowd if people are just kind of grabbing papers and trying to put it into their session. Um, so to facilitate both this process and this kind of real-time collaborative planning, uh, we developed a system called Frenzy by Lydia Chilton um, that uses actionable feedback to guide contributions by letting people know what needs work across the two phases of problem solving. Okay. So the core idea here is that by changing just the actionable feedback during these two courses of problem solving without changing the tool, what you're able to do is you're able to switch from what's called a crowdware system where a crowd of people are collaborating um, to a traditional groupware system where a smaller group of people can work together to deliberate and deal with these tight constraints. Right? So it's a really nice example of where by using crowds and groups, um, we're able to come up with a solution that, that works quite well um, that you wouldn't have thought doing with just crowds or, or, or with groups by themselves. Yeah? Can you just clarify, I'm not quite understand. Is the key idea here that the metadata allows you to partition the data so that it's roughly, you roughly have independent pools of data that the, that the groups can then consider? Ah, uh, uh, so, so, uh, it's not even that smart. So what, what it is smart about is just telling people what are things that haven't been tagged that much yet, and what are the things, right, and there's, there's a little bit of intelligence here, what are the things that are likely to get orphaned, right? Like if we don't have enough tags for this, if there's not enough potential sessions it could fit into, um, then we just don't have enough uh, of the parameters collected to, to even deal with the optimization problem, right? So that's what happens in phase one. And then in phase two, um, it's by hand, right? So the, the chairs come in, look at these possible groupings and they start making sessions and then sometimes there's a conflict. If, you know, you can make this session or this other one for this paper and then they discuss and then they say, well, I think this is the one we're gonna go with. Right? They go with that one and they continue the discussion. And the tight constraints are the same or different from the global constraints? Uh, the same, yeah, the same. So when I say tight constraints, right, it's just this idea that um, if we were doing the very naive thing where um, we had a crowd of people and we're just making sessions, like as we would on papers, then you, know, you don't want someone to grab a paper So in some of the follow-up work we did uh, the next year on a different tool called Seshi, what we could actually do is that we could compute, if I were to make sessions right now using a you know, computer algorithm, uh, what are the papers that would get orphaned because I don't have enough metadata in those areas? Right? So you could do things like that where you're, you're making some assumptions about how the sessions get made, but you kind of do this kind of, okay, well, if I were to make sessions where you know, these are possible sessions I could make and I randomly select them or I have some criteria for selecting them, where am I still lacking metadata? what are the papers that are likely to be left behind, right? So implicitly what you're finding is the places where the constraints are tighter, because um, in those places, you know, those papers are kind of getting kicked out because some other paper had to be in some other session that was being discussed. Okay. Um, happy to chat more offline, if that helps. Thanks. Okay, so let me move on. Um, 
and come back to this general challenge of engaging uh, the community, okay? And let's talk about for authors and attendees for a second, where we need to provide them with relevant suggestions if these processes and tools are to be of any use to them, okay? And here, you know, just think about this as a machine problem where it's like, okay, we could do TFIDF or something like that over there. We do a recommendation uh, system over here and then build up a profile uh, of preferences and then, and then just provide recommendations. Um, and I think it's fine that we treat these problems as isolated problems for the machine to solve, um, but we could do better than that uh, with the ecosystems approach. So the second idea uh, that I like to present to you is what I call incentive chaining, um, where the idea is to engage increasing sets of ecosystem members by using the data that's collected from an earlier interaction to promote further contributions from others in a subsequent interaction, okay? And then to do that again. So what I'm showing you here is that the expert categories that we get from the Frenzy tool, um, from the program committee members, we couple it with TFIDF, and then we have that go into the recommendations that we present uh, to authors, right? And it does a lot better than if you just did TFIDF by itself. Um, so now, once the authors have done this, um, you could take all the affinities, we get about 10,000 data points from authors, um, as affinities as seeds into this collaborative filtering algorithm uh, for attendees. So what it allows you to do is that it allows you to get rid of what's called the co-start problem that commonly happens, right, where you have to like a bunch of stuff for recommendation systems before it starts giving you really good recommendations. But here, you know, we, we have great data. It's actually doubly filtered, so to speak, right, from both of these processes um, that, that could kick off our uh, recommendation system. And people get great recommendations here, so it's much easier for them to find things they like. And then we get more data. We know what um, talks are gonna be more popular uh, from, from that better data as well. Okay, so moving on to phase two, uh, helping organizers resolve conflicts. So we collected all this data, right? from all these tools and we should just feed it all into a computer and then hit a big fat optimize button, right? What do you think, Ronald? I would, be, I would say no, it's not just organizers. I wanna feel like I did something. Yeah, it's just so that, conf so, so the answer is no, but Rob's explanation for the no is just so the conference organizers felt like they had a role to play, that they weren't useless. Um, well, I'll give you two other reasons for why I think um, there's a, th it's, a, it's a better approach to, to not just feed it to an optimizer, okay? So f the first one is that even though we collected about 10 to 20,000 data points um, from all these processes, that's actually a very small part of the problem, right? So if you think about even pairwise relationships between papers with 400, 500 papers, you know, you're looking at something in the hundreds of thousands, right? So what we collect is actually a very small part of the problem, meaning that the optimization problem is just underspecified, right? So we could try to hit the optimize button and the computer will think that the solution is as good as it can solve it, um, but actually it's gonna create incoherent sessions. Um, and normally you would think, well, okay, so let's just go in and fix those incoherent sessions right after, um, but it's actually really hard here, right? Because the two organizers who think about doing this step, they don't actually have the knowledge of how all the papers fit together, right? A lot of that knowledge is distributed to the community and we gather this information, but the organizers just to even go through the sections, sessions and judge whether they're good, um, it's actually a really hard task. And then the second part, uh, the second reason, which is close to what Rob said, but maybe with a little more flavor to it, uh, is um, wh what is the role of the chairs, right? And the chairs often have these other goals when they're planning conferences um, that's not easily accounted for uh, and that might be hard to encode, right? So they think about where are you know, uh, different themes that they want to highlight, what are, um, wh how they want to distribute the best papers, right? There's all these other things that the chairs think about um, that's in their tacit knowledge that other people don't know about that they would like to be able to affect um, as, they, as they go through the planning process. Okay. Um, so to allow all those pieces to come together, um, the third core idea is gonna be community-based mixed initiative interfaces that's gonna put the organizers in the driver's seat and give them a holistic view of all the constraints and preferences. Okay. So let me show you how this works. Um, so you could get a multi-dimensional view of the schedule by all these different view options that uh, our chair might be interested in. And then for a while, Kyle's really into personas, so kind of different types of people and what they might wanna see. Um, and then in here, all these red dots are different conflicts, right? And the, 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 the chair can go in and say, okay, well, I wanna maybe fix those conflicts by moving that session. And the system highlights in green these different recommendations of what would be good swaps. Okay. But notice that the system doesn't make the swap for the chair. Um, the chair is entirely in control because these conflicts are what the system knows about. Right? It's not all the conflicts, it's just the conflicts that the system knows about from the data that we collected. Right? So the chair stays in control to apply their own tacit knowledge 
um, but to also be guided by the community data and the hard constraints that are in the system. Um, and what's really nice about this process is that it allows the organizers to work on the schedule with confidence. Okay, so let me explain what this means. So you see this red line? It's the number of conflicts going down over time. Okay, that's not surprising, right? You're using an optimizer, whether, whether it's an interactive one or not, the conflicts are gonna go down. Okay? What's really interesting is that even when the conflicts aren't going down that much, the chairs are actually making a bunch of changes to the schedule. Um, and what's happening is that when the chairs think about enacting one of these goals they have for the conference, they're able to do that in such a way where when they hit propose move to try to do their thing, they know how that move is gonna affect what the community members wanted and what are the hard constraints, right? So they could actually take that into account to make sure they could enact their task and knowledge in a way that doesn't screw up um, the other stuff that everyone else cares about. Right? So you get this really nice process now where you can get uh, the task and knowledge, the community data, and the hard constraints all working together. Um, so let me highlight some of the high-level outcomes um, from using Kobe, um, deploying it at, at Kai and CSCW, um, and I'm gonna show you some of the data from 2012 and 2013. So we now have an inclusive process that engages 1,500 community members uh, in planning, uh, which is about half of the conference. Um, it reduced organizers' planning time from 100 hours down to five hours. Um, and the organizers were able to produce better schedules by resolving hundreds of these conflicts that we gathered from community members that they didn't even know about previously. Okay. Um, and I think what's allowing us to get these outcomes um, it's really this whole ecosystem working together for community-informed planning, where we're thinking about doing collaborative planning, but across crowds and groups. Um, we're thinking about how to chain contributions across the ecosystem, where we're getting progressively more data um, by using earlier interactions to inform later ones. Um, we also have these mixed initiative interfaces that empower organizers right, to make these informed decisions by bringing together um, all parts of our machine intelligence, the community's data, and, the, and then the test and knowledge. Um, so before I move on to my next example, any questions on Kobe and community-informed planning? David, yeah. Um, is it still used for, for, is it still used for, for this schedule? Okay, so great question. Uh, this is gonna be a longish answer, so let me, let me explain. Um, so the scheduling tool, still in use. Uh, Comfer, I hope, still in use, they better. Uh, Excellent, yeah, so. Yeah, 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 and program the program scheduling program. tool, still in use. Um, however, uh, at least anecdotally, uh, the schedules have been really bad in the last few years. And here's why, uh, they're not using the whole ecosystem, right? So they're using the scheduling tool, that component, um, to resolve hard conflicts, right? So yes, uh, a speaker is not in the two different rooms at once, right? That's taken care of. Um, but we're actually losing a lot of this rich community data and this value that I started with of having an inclusive process where we advance the goals of our community members it's not happening because we, we, we don't have the whole ecosystem running right now, right? And some of that's because you know, we went on to faculty jobs and we didn't maintain it, uh, which is an issue, right? It's something we wanna think about. Um, but it's, it's actually, you know, in one way, you know, I'm, I'm kinda like, this shows you why we need the whole ecosystem, right? But on another side, it also shows how we really need to figure out how to put more ecosystems out there <laughs> and to continue using them. Um, we did share the code with two of the biggest conference planning companies. Um, and I, I believe there's some work that they're doing to incorporate it into their kind of official tool chain, so that's good. Um, but that's, that's where we're at. <laughs> Any other questions before I move on? Okay, so let me move on and let's get into uh, thinking about scaling research training. Um, and in particular, I'm gonna focus on this value that I care about of cultivating uh, self-directed learning. Um, and what I want to start with is to say that what we found is that if you really want your students to be self-directed um, so they could conduct independent research, um, they're going to need what are called regulation skills. Okay. So in psychology and in the learning sciences, regulation skills are commonly defined as given a goal that you care about, what are all the cognitive, metacognitive, motivational, and even emotional skills that you would need for reaching that goal? And for independent research, Students are gonna need regulation skills, including things like planning, monitoring their progress, um, recognizing obstacles, and seeking help to overcome different challenges that arise throughout the research process. And if students lack these skills, um, they're gonna be confined in a way to, to root tests or they could struggle to make progress where they wait for their mentors to tell them what to do next. Right? So if we really want students to be self-directed, um, then we're gonna need students to build these regulation skills, but, but the thing that I'm leaving off the slide is that these regulation skills are actually really hard to build, 
for students, right? And what I'm also leaving out on the slide, and um, I apologize to the faculty in the room, um, is that generally speaking, uh, we do a terrible job of teaching regulation skills to students, okay? And um, perhaps, you know, it's not true here, but I've seen kind of enough examples of this to think that research shouldn't be just banging your head against the wall until you figure it out, right? And there's gotta be a better way to do this, and I think that better way starts with figuring out how to develop these skills uh, in more of our students. So to address this challenge, uh, we created a computational ecosystem that we call Agile Research Studios that provides a model for research training uh, within a learning community. So in this model, all the students, regardless of how senior they are, uh, conduct independent research and they receive authentic research practice, by which I mean um, that all the students go through a self-directed project cycle where they set goals, learn what they need to learn, plan their work, make progress, reflect on what's learned and, and completed, and then they, they do this process again. And the core idea behind this ARS model is that it scales faculty time, okay? We've already talked a bit about why the apprenticeship model um, doesn't scale very well beyond a very small uh, teacher to student ratio, but you might think, well, why don't we take a hierarchical model, right? Where we have the faculty at the top, um, they train the graduate students, and then we have the graduate students train the undergrads, okay? Um, the problem with this model is that as graduate students are just learning how to do research, um, they're actually novice mentors, right? And one of the things that's been found um, repeatedly in learning sciences is that <coughs> being good at something doesn't mean you're good at teaching it, right? There's actually a big difference between those two things. Um, so what happens to undergraduates is that they could do research, but they end up often doing a lot of root tasks um, for the graduate students, and they don't actually learn to self-direct their own research. So to overcome the shortcomings of these models, um, I'm gonna introduce a dispersed control model where the core idea is that to overcome this 1x challenge of one faculty responding to many students, uh, we're gonna distribute a lot of the roles and responsibilities of helping students build regulation skills to the entire community. Um, so let me show you how this works. Um, and I'll start just by saying that the Agile Research Studios model is a computational ecosystem um, that's designed around developing regulation skills with all these different processes, social structures, and tools working together. So we adapt the Agile process, um, which uh, comes from software development and from design, uh, to research to scaffold the self-directed research cycle. Um, we have mentoring that's distributed across all these different social structures to support students planning research work and getting help within a supportive community. And then we have these virtual studio tools that support learning through the Agile process and that promote effective interactions uh, within this community. Okay. So I won't have time to go through every single component um, of this model, but let me give you a couple of vertical slices just to build intuition. Um, so I wanna start by sharing with you um, how students in ARS, uh, in an ARS studio, uh, learn to plan research work. Um, so the first thing is that students do sprint planning, okay? So uh, students plan uh, two week intervals and they plan their sprints and they're looking to deliver not user value, but research value, okay? Uh, I'm happy to talk offline about what I mean by research value and how we're teaching students to do that, but the high level idea is that um, what is the thing that I could do in the next two weeks that's gonna help me learn the most about my research project, right? That's gonna give me the most on my arguments or about my hypotheses, that's gonna allow me to then take the next step. Right? And that's something that we teach students to think about. Um, and what we do to help students learn how to plan effectively is that we have these social structures called SIG meetings or special interest group meetings. And in this meeting, um, we have about two to three student groups being led by a faculty mentor who fades over time as a graduate student mentor, one of my PhD students, um, learns to become the leader of their own SIG, right? So my graduate students, um, by the time they graduate, are, uh, would have already mentored five to eight projects uh, and 10 to 15 students. So effectively, by the time my graduate students graduate, they've already ran a mini research lab, okay? And what happens in this meeting is that students present their sprint plans and they're getting feedback and coaching from both the faculty mentor, the graduate student mentor, and their peers on how to plan more effectively, right? So the goal is not just to say, okay, this isn't working, here's what you do to fix it. There's a lot of uh, coaching that goes on in training students to think about, oh, okay, well, huh, that's interesting. Well, if that's the problem, then who could you ask for help? What might be ways that we try out different solutions to overcome it? Um, you have this plan. Okay, this is the story you want to accomplish. It doesn't seem like you could do this in two weeks. What might be an alternative version of it um, that is actually something that's uh, tractable within the two weeks that you have? Okay, so there's all these different strategies that we're coaching students through. Um, and then we have some tools like the sprint log where students actually do the planning um, record what it is they do, and it looks a lot like a simplified version of a project tracking tool that you'd be familiar with. Um, but there's some minor differences where these uh, prompts that are put in 
to support students developing regulation skills. So there's these kind of questions that ask students, um, what are some blockers or roadblocks you might encounter? What is the value or the purpose of, of the story and so on and so forth? Yeah. So are, are central interest to be research domains or are they interested in life sciences? Yeah, great question. Um, they're mostly research domains. I organize them more or less around a grant, right? So like an area of research. So the students um, have this community of practice who are, who are doing research in similar areas. And now I'll talk about how to connect students across those areas of kind of practice. Okay, um, so this is uh, the planning slice. And uh, let me just show you quickly what a SIG meeting looks like. So you have my student, Bomani, who's presenting uh, some of his work, right? And you have all these other students working on different projects, um, giving him feedback. Um, and then you also have my dog, Stella, there, who's just uh, mostly there to get petted, um, but also for some emotional support as well. Okay, so let me move on and talk about um, how this model supports help and collaboration. And the core idea here is that we're gonna distribute help across the entire community, right? So one of the things I left out is, if you're using all your mentoring time to help students learn how to plan, what happens to the actual challenges that students have as they do their research, right? How do we help them resolve the blockers that come up as they're working? Um, and one of the ways we do that is we have this social structure in this meeting called the studio meeting, where all the students across these different research areas come together, um, and we meet for three hours, where during that time we do some instruction of learning how to do research. Um, we also do peer help, um, and then we do some status updates where students are presenting work in progress and getting feedback um, from the other students. Now, one of the things we do in studio is pair research, um, which just pairs people up to, to, to help each other. Okay, so let me show you how pair research works. Um, here's pair research. Um, here's me going in, and I said, I need some help finalizing uh, the intro to my talk. Okay, and other people are doing the same, putting in what they need help with. And then I rate how well I could help them. So I could really help on those things, and eh, not so much down here, right? And so on and so forth, and other people are doing this as well. And once we all fill this in, we hit make pairs. Confetti falls from the sky, of course, right, as expected. Okay, and then we have these pairs, right? And what it's doing is it's finding the students who could best help each other, right? But if you think about it also from the role of uh, a, a faculty member or someone with, let's call it a rare skill, if a student needs a skill and you're the only person that, that can help them, you're likely to get paired with that person, right? But what you're doing is you're trying to maximally use all the expertise uh, across your community so that anyone and everyone is helping, um, but it's finding these global matchings across the community. Um, so I think pair research is a really great tool and you guys should all go use it. Um, it's now on this uh, web platform that you guys can start your own groups on. Um, but before we just run away and say pair research is great, um, I do think you'll get benefits on your own, but, but I really want to make this point that distributed help is not just a single tool, um, but instead it's having this helping culture um, that results from having a whole ecosystem around distributed help, okay? So what I'm showing you on the upper left uh, is students help each other over the shoulder uh, in the lab all the time. Um, on Slack, we have all these different channels that are created for different kinds of questions that students might run into. Um, on the upper right, uh, my students started their own mentoring and onboarding program for new students just this quarter. Um, they just said, you know what, it's, there's a lot to learn when you're a new student. Let's do a weekly check-in uh, with every new student uh, with a mentor paired with a mentee. Um, and then from things like SIG meetings, um, students actually get a lot uh, out of that meeting in learning how to, to get help um, and who it is that they could find help from. Um, and my students also engage in a lot of self-reflection. So one of the things we do is every quarter, um, my students do a 10-page self-assessment where they're reflecting on their work practices and collaboration. So one of the questions we ask them is thinking about what they learned uh, in collaboration teamwork, um, helping and receiving help from other people, right? And these practices kind of all together are helping to support this distributed help culture that we've created. Um, so let me share with you guys some of the outcomes of uh, Agile Research Studios. Uh, so in the first three years of running this program, um, I mentored 50 students, mostly undergraduates, uh, on 25 independent research projects. Um, these students won 29 undergraduate research awards uh, from the university, and that's uh, the most out of any faculty member. Actually, it's the most, if you combine all the CS faculty members in the last 10 years, it's still the most. Um, and it's the most out of any faculty member uh, at the university. Um, and then the students published 11 papers and extended abstracts, uh, including four student research competition winners. Uh, most recently, Sarah Lim, who won the CHI student research competition. Um, and then this last stat, uh, something I'm really proud of, is that 96% of the students stay in this program um, for more than two quarters. And, and most, by most, I mean almost all, um, basically enroll sophomore, junior year, and they, they continue until they graduate. So it's really nice that as we get this retention, um, as students are going through this agile process, they're kind of learning and developing their competencies over time as they're building their regulation skills as well. Um, 
So some of the evidence that we have, the early evidence of students building regulation skills includes students uh, learning and adapting different planning strategies. So we've seen students report uh, building at fidelity appropriate for the current stage of the research, prioritizing important features and research questions, sequencing tasks, and in some cases moving on despite uncertainty or imperfect knowledge because you know you have to do that. Um, from the help and help seeking side, uh, we saw that students help more than a third of their studio members every quarter. And students were also developing their help seeking disposition. So we have a quote here that says, I can ask for help and that everyone asks for help and it doesn't make them stupid to need help. And you might think this is just, yeah, whatever, that's, that's common. Um, actually, help seeking is really hard for a lot of people. Right? And developing these skills and just having any evidence that uh, students are building these dispositions is actually a really nice thing. Um, and on the right, I'm showing you uh, the help graph from winter 2016 where every node is a student, every color is a SIG, and what you see is that students help each other within the same SIG but also across six, right? Because you see all these lines going across the colors as well. Um, so coming back to that question about faculty time, uh, it now takes me 10 to 12 hours a week uh, to run my studio, okay? So the week before the Kai deadline, uh, my life is just as bad as yours, okay? So I haven't figured out quite how to do that, um, although I do have some ideas that I'm happy to chat about offline. And my time is divided this way. I spend about five hours uh, in five SIG meetings. Um, it's actually four now, because uh, one of my, my graduate students is senior enough that he's running his own SIG, and I've effectively been kicked out of his sick, okay? Um, and then three hours for the studio meeting, and then I, I spend about two hours in person for office hours, and then two hours kind of online and just responding to things as needed um, for, 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 for helping. Yes? How many additional hours are you spending mentoring your graduate students? Ah, that's all included in this model. That's included in this model. That's included in this model. So uh, there's also a graduate student sig. It's, uh, for mine, it's called the summer barbecue sig because we turn on the grill. Uh, but but uh, yes, there's a graduate student SIG, and my graduate students follow the same model. So they, you know, they mentor their own SIGs, right? The, the exact part that's different, um, but they're in a SIG as well with other graduate students and, and so on. So. Okay, um, so just to review, uh, we built a computational ecosystem called Agile Research Studios um, that by using the ecosystem, we're helping students develop regulation skills um, for planning, for help seeking, Right, across all these different interactions that are supported by the processes, social structures, as well as the tools that we have. And with this, we're able to extend the scale and the capacity of this community um, to produce and to learn, right? In a way that a single faculty member could never do, um, but with the ecosystem, you can, right? And this is, you know, one of the things that I, I get really excited about when I start thinking about ecosystems this way is what it's allowing us to do um, that, that, you know, by a single human or, or if we waited for the technology, um, we wouldn't be able to. Um, so one question that I'm really interested in exploring in future work um, is how do these regulation skills that we're building for students in these studios help them beyond the studio as they go even out of school, right, onto their jobs and other things that they do. Um, so for me, you know, the joke is always that, um, you know, I'm, I'm not training regulation skills to, 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 to develop researchers. I mean, I am, but um, I'm actually using research to help students develop regulation skills because research is so damn hard <laughs> that you're constantly hitting difficulty. Right, and learning how to plan and, and all these skills that come up. So what I'm really interested in is understanding how, um, what is this gonna allow my students to do when they go out in the world in reaching their own goals and attacking problems that, that's really hard um, that normally maybe they wouldn't have thought, thought to attack. Right? And this is something I'm really excited to study uh, in, in our continuing work. Um, so before I move on to, to the latter sections of my talk, um, any questions about Agile Research Studios? Yes, please. everyone's gonna be a great mentor, especially in teaching regulation skills. And that's not what's happening. What's happening is that we're shifting the roles of every member of the community. So before, as a mentor, I had to spend a lot of time just making sure the students can make progress. So I would help them overcome the bar. Right? But as we started doing things like the distributor help, my time actually gets free to teach regulation skills. Right? So instead of me just focusing on getting the student to produce, I can focus on teaching how to plan. Right? It's like teaching the student how to plan. So it's that change of roles that makes it work. It's not that have actually distributed the, the, the mentor per se. Right? But there's also a lot of training for the graduate students to become better mentors um, in the same sense. So. Yeah, but it sounds like another key target is that when you've actually done it, you set up a process. Yeah. Because this reminds me very much of how we design programs. You know, the Durham Technology, you know, Arthur and Co. Associate Durham. Because what they basically did was say, you put all your students into this very 
very systematic process where to build a program, they have to go through these regulated steps. Uh -huh. And then you refuse to talk to them until they've gone through those steps. Uh -huh. So what you actually do is you get them to solve a lot of their problems before they come to you. Uh -huh. It seems like in a way you're doing the same thing. Yes, we're picking more skills. Um, but we do, right, um, we do also have the social uh, support, the community support. So there's a process. There's these community structures that provide scaffolding and that provide support. Right? And then there's these tools that, that connect people and make it, make it possible. So process is a huge part of it. I want to say more than that. Take the example by yeah. the notion of sprints. seems like you're sourcing problem definition in here, right? Because they have to formulate a goal for their sprint, right? Yes. Yes. Very clever. But they're also getting a lot of scaffolding from them. So on. And that scaffolding is important, right? It's one of the reach gaps of Postgre, but I, I agree with what you're saying. Yeah. So yes, so like this wouldn't work if you take away the process. It also wouldn't work if you took away these social structures that help people learn. It also wouldn't work very well without the tools. It's really hard to turn people on to this. It takes too long. No longer supported by this piece of data. Um, so we think some evidence, though, that these health systems 
to balance time, but, but such, such is uh, the way the world works. <laughs> so let me move on and uh, just give you a quick preview of, of kind of what's next uh, in computational ecosystems. Um, so I won't get into this in a lot of detail given the time, but um, one of the things I'm really excited about is thinking about ecosystem level architectures that can kind of bring together people to, to support all these different needs um, and also to support the members themselves. Okay? And one of the places we're looking at for this um, is this area called on-the-go crowdsourcing where we're interested in people um, doing small tasks to help other people in their local communities, where part of the goal is to do this tasking thing that's uh, perhaps a little different than the kind of Uber model, so to speak, but a lot of it's to really build social capital in, in local communities, right? So here we have um, someone who's going to the package center, but they're also picking up some packages um, for other people in their dorms. Um, and one of the challenges here um, to getting these kind of systems to work is you have to balance the convenience and other goals of the individuals with what the system needs, right? So you might have many different tasks across different regions, um, some of which are more important, being shown with the longer bars. Um, here I'm showing you this for, for lost and found, where we actually have a, a lost and found task that's been decomposed into these smaller 30-second tasks you could do in different regions. Um, and what happens is if someone's walking by and they're about to hit region three, as in this example, um, you might actually want to wait, right? Especially if you think there's a good chance they might actually end up in region two. Um, and then if they go to region two, you might want to hit and get them to help conveniently on their way but what would be awesome is that if everyone's just kind of doing what they do without getting out of their way, and then you still get globally effective outcomes. Okay? And that's what we're starting to do with these mechanisms, uh, and this one from my student Youngsung called Hit or Wait, where um, the system just kind of runs and people just walk and do what they do, and then the system kind of notifies them in the moments where the help is most needed, um, using decision theory to think about what's gonna happen next and what are the places they might go. Where in this example, decision theory is no longer used just as a way to optimize, but as a way to create new interactions that allow community members um, to share in, in these kind of ways of helping each other. And I'm really excited about this as one of the directions we're looking at. Um, so in another direction, we've been thinking more deeply about what it means to think about mixed initiative interactions, but across this entire ecosystem. Um, one of the examples we're looking at is for learning how to code. Um, so we've been working on readily available learning experiences where if you go to any website, okay, and you say, I wanna learn how this works on Tumblr, See that? It's like super smooth, right? It's like one of the best scrolling effects on the web. Um, and I want to know how, to, how that works, and I don't want to only find the relevant lines of code. Um, I want the system to help me build a conceptual model of how to do this in my own head, right? So that I could go and apply it on problems that I care about. So one of the first things we started to do in this uh, is a tool called Isoplex by my student Josh Hitzman, um, where we're looking at the New York Skyline article here from National Geographic, okay, and just cool interactions that are happening. And instead of just finding relevant lines of code, what it's doing is showing a condensed call graph and using these different filters um, to help people navigate different parts of the code. So for example, you can look at everything that has to do with the Ajax call and kind of trace through that Ajax call all the way through, not only for the functions, but, but what called it and what it would call after. You could also define these custom filters. Um, and these custom filters allows you to say things like, let me trace everything that happened with this variable value as it goes through the code. And you can kind of use positive and negative filters there. Um, you also get these asynchronous findings, which are really key for JavaScript, because otherwise you have no idea where the hell the code came from, <laughs> as is typically the case with JavaScript. Okay? And you can go in and inspect these different things, um, look at different pieces of code, and go in and label and start to understand what is this actually doing, right? So it's almost like putting together the pieces of a puzzle, where you're doing this iterative sense-making process with supporting it for learners using the tool and the learner's own, own knowledge um, as they're trying to piece together how this works. Um, and this is a wonderful start, but we're actually taking a leap here. We're using some of the ideas here um, for one of these tools. We're thinking, what if we had a bunch of these tools and we could connect them to do mixed initiative scaffolding, um, you know, in, in contrast to uh, software realized scaffolds that Mark Isbell talks about, where um, what the learner does in building the conceptual model, those labels the learners generate, is what allows the system to construct the scaffolded exercises that's needed um, to learn the next step. And I think this idea um, is really promising because it's allowing us to think about how to scaffold learning in really complex domains where intelligent tutors can't really do um, because you need these deep cognitive models of what's going on, but, that, but using a combination of what the learner's doing and what the tool is supporting the learners to do and connecting the self-directed learning process across these stages, um, we could actually scaffold uh, much more complex learning domains. Um, so let me end my talk uh, just by spending a few minutes talking about the role of technology in advancing uh, human values at scale. And 
Um, I want to start just by saying um, much has been said about human values, right? Pick up a book in philosophy, psychology. Uh, if you're interested in HCI, uh, Bhatia Prima's work is really nice as well. Um, so I'm not going to rehash any of this, okay? And people don't all share the same values, right? So I'm not going to try to pit one value against another. Um, but I do want to make a point about scaling with technology. Um, and the point I want to make is that when you scale with technology, um, you can amplify the compromises on our values um, as we embrace the machine for what the machine could do for us and miss out on something else, okay? Um, so a chilling depiction of the consequences of uh, compromising our values is offered by Ian Fossil in the short story, How the Machine Stops, uh, written in 1909, okay? And in this short story, there is the internet, social media, and video conferencing, okay? And it sounds a lot like the technological golden age of today, um, but it's actually a story about what well, we had to give up about ourselves when we accepted things as good enough so that the machine may progress, the machine may progress, and the machine may progress uh, eternally. Um, and there's a part of the story uh, that's very early. It's about a, a boy and his mother, and those are the two main characters. And the boy asks the mother, uh, his mother, to, to, to come visit him, okay? Um, but she wouldn't, and she says that she could see him on this plate right now, like, why do, uh, plate being the screen. Why, don't, why does she need to, to go travel all the way to go see him? And he says, and he pleads with her, that the machine is much, but it's not everything. Um, I see something like you in this plate, but I do not see you. I hear something like you through this telephone, but I do not hear you. Um, this is why I want you to come. Pay me a visit so that we can meet face to face and talk about the hopes that are in my mind. Um, so every time I read this quote, I think I just, I feel slightly heartwarming, but mostly heartbroken. Because um, even as we're creating these incredible machines that scale to doing incredible things, um, here's just a small example of something simple that, that we might have missed um, as we scaled um, to do these things. Um, so. This is the question I want to leave you guys with uh, as I end this talk. So if you think about a value that you wish to scale, something that you care about for humanity, and then you think about the solutions uh, that technology provides for scaling that value. If they're fully aligned, great, okay? I have nothing to say to you. Um, but if they're not, what do you do? And one of the things that I'm really scared of, um, <laughs> like in talking to the grad students, apparently there's a lot of things I'm scared of, but one of the things I'm really scared of um, is that it might be tempting to just shift your values and say, no, 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 no. These are actually my values, right? I just have these technological values. Um, but I think we would all lose something if you let uh, the problems you could solve with technology dictate how you express your values uh, through your work. And instead, what I hope is that we would all allow ourselves time um, to, to think about the values you want to scale, even if technology doesn't get us there, right? So I don't know how to scale research training for developing self-directed learners to a million people. Um, but I'm going to start with a humble practice of 20, OK? And I think for me, um, you know, it's a really wonderful thing um, to find fulfillment in, in doing what I want to do. Uh, even if it's really hard, I'm not very good at it. <laughs> okay, so um, to do that, or for all of us to do that, it's going to require that we're mindful of our values, that we reach beyond what technology can provide us. And really, I want to emphasize this word, uh, learn and learn to scale, right? That scaling is not just about having more capable machines. And I've shown you in these examples, scaling is really complicated. Uh, we have to be humble as we learn to scale for the things that we actually care about. And we're going to need to build new knowledge and new ways of thinking. And I think computational ecosystems is an important step in that direction. Um, because if it's about humankind, then thinking about ourselves as part of this larger ecology is going to be important. Um, and we're going to need computational thinking as well, um, so we could bring all our ingenuity to bear um, as we deal with the complexity of the world. So with your help, um, I hope we could bridge uh, you know, our, our, our kind of hopes for, for technology and design and, and embrace that power, um, but also with our deepest needs uh, as, as humans. Okay. And, and with that, I'd like to thank my collaborators uh, on the Kobe project for their work on community informed planning. Um, I, just, I love my students in DTR. Just say they work incredibly hard to realize these different visions that we have uh, with only eight points a week on their sprints. Right? I actually limit the points. Uh, but I have my graduate students uh, name bolded on the top. Right? In red, I have my faculty collaborators. And I really can't do this work um, without the Delta Lab, um, which is this interdisciplinary research lab that I formed with, with Liz Gerber, uh, who's an organizational behavioralist and a designer, Matt Easterday, who's a learning scientist, Mel is a CS plus learning science person, and I'm, I'm me, okay? And you know, a lot of this has allowed us to, to do work where we don't have the blinders on anymore of our disciplines and just think about the problems we want to solve within the supportive community. And um, I think MIT is an amazing place to do research. I, I love my time here. Um, when you're done, uh, with your studies here or when you're ready for the next stage, um, we are looking for students, postdocs, fellows, and, and developers, okay? So thank you so much for being a great audience. Thank you. Uh, maybe uh, 
Yeah, I'll, I'll take maybe just one or two questions, and I just don't want people to, to have to, to stay for, for longer than they have, because we are over time. And I'm happy to take one or two offline, too. Yes, please. Sorry for running a little over. Thank you. It's really thoughtful, actually. Yeah, thank really you for, nice. the, for really, the great questions. I, no, I really enjoyed it. I, uh, <laughs> I hope I answered it decently given the time. But, uh, yeah, I think I need to. And the study so showed me a little bit more. I think the bulk part of the follow was it, what would help me would be like examples of what the metadata items were, because I yes. couldn't quite figure out the text. They're just tags. They're just subject tags, I think. That's all they oh, okay. They're just category tags or subject tags, I think. Okay, that would have helped. Sorry. No, no, no problem at all. Um, but I love the idea of these um, of the thing meetings. Yeah, it's terrific. And I, uh, and I see your paper about that, by the way. Yeah. Yes. Yes, it is on the website. And I think we can learn a lot from software engineering, like from software development. No, it's very nice. Yeah, very good. Anyway, nice Thank to you. see you. Thank you so much. Yes, very thanks. inspiring. Thank you. Oh, so, yes. uh, you may all already know all of this, but I figured I'd bring one I to show you. Thank you for seeing it. I saw in the, in the abstract yes. something in common with Software. I kind of wanted to applaud after you talked about values, but it moved on and I missed the appropriate moment to press it. But uh, have, it has, have you thought about the fact that uh, some people might refuse to run your JavaScript code? And you were talking about debugging JavaScript code. Yeah. And uh, well, you know, there are some of us who won't run it because we don't so trust that, it. That runs on the open web right now. And what part is of it the open web? Exactly. So it actually and runs on most websites right now, the tool in the browser. Right? What? What? Uh, sorry, the tool that I showed you. You can actually go to any website. It's like a, it works like uh, the Chrome inspector. Yeah. Right. But when it's giving you a lot more than okay. Chrome inspector. I guess I was a bit confused because yeah. you were talking about ha how to understand JavaScript code. Yes. Which means I suppose any uh, any JavaScript code. So like on, on the website, JavaScript code that's yes. embedded in the website. On the website. Right. Exactly. That's the point. Many of us won't run that. Mm. Uh, we will install free programs that were written in JavaScript, like add-ons, but we sure. won't run the webs. We won't let a site just send us a program to run. Exactly. Okay. I mean, yep. how could we possibly trust that? Yep. Yep. So, so it's something for me to think about. Right? So but yeah, I'll, I will read this. And, uh, would you good. like, by any chance, my pleasure card? Uh, sure, I don't know what a pleasure card is. Well, you know what a business card is. I do know what a business card is. I don't well, know what you a pleasure card is. figure out what a pleasure card is. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming to the talk. I appreciate it. So, uh, if you're interested ever in talking more, send me a message. Will do. Thanks. Hello. Both of the following statements are lies, okay? So the first statement is, we planned it all out ahead of time and it took a few months, right? The other statement is, we had no reason, right? So both are false, and I think the reason they're false is that, especially now, right? I mean, when we first started, there's probably actually no reason to believe this, but now whenever we build, like we have this problem we care about building, when we're building a component, even if we're just building one component right now, we're thinking about this, right? So we're thinking about how this component is going to be like, okay? Um, but as we build those components, we might learn things. Uh, 
just during office hours, uh, you, you mean one-on-one, right? Yeah. yeah, during office hours. But what's interesting is that this actually freed up my time to do more of that, right? that um, because I'm so efficient there, I could actually have more individual time to do that. So direction and the future career there. Thank you. Thank you. Stuff in my bag. Yeah. I'll read to it. Hi. Hi. Uh, how to? Uh, 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 awesome. Thanks, Rob. Facing two challenges. One is I'll be right there. Thank you. Doing our groups groups or doing this for primary school, right? Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I, I don't know a lot about primary school education, but the learning scientists have been thinking a lot about, you know, inquiry based learning, all these different kinds of things for And then on another level, yeah. uh, science education content right now is rather wretched. I'm sorry. Great question. Um, like Scott was saying, I, I mean, there's a lot that's been done in inquiry learning uh, for, I mean, Brian Reiser at Northwestern is one of the people who lead a lot of that work in the learning sciences. Um, I wouldn't call him a tool builder, so that's not that part of what you're looking at, but there's been really good literature uh, in how to teach and how to learn uh, inquiry-based skills. Um, and then uh, Quintana, Chris Quintana, I wanna say, at Michigan also has really nice learning science work. Uh, Chris, I think it's just Chris, but uh, Quintana is Q-U-I-N-T-A-T-A-N-A, -A -A, right? Um, he's also written some nice things. But I think he might have been Brian's student, probably one. But um, yeah, and I don't know much about the collaborative software stuff, so good luck. <laughs> 